you know, we, we want to hear about your journey, um, Judge Rivera. So, and both of you, just tell us about your journey, about um, how you got to, to where you are today. Jenny, I, I defer to your senior status here. Yeah, the, the senior associate, let's not call it uh, senior status, <laughs> although I know that was your turn to begin with, Mike. Good evening, everyone. Um, before I uh, start my very brief comments, I want to thank very much uh, the Puerto Rican Bar Association, the Historical Society uh, for the program and for giving an opportunity so, for so many members of our community to speak about their experiences and the challenges that they and uh, their parents, grandparents and their families and communities have faced. So I thank you very much uh, for that. And I, I wanna thank also Marilyn Marcus for her assistance with this segment of the program, uh, really helping us make it possible. Thank you, Marilyn, uh, for, for the hard work you put into this. And I do wanna thank all the past and current presidents, officers, and members of the board of directors of the Puerto Rican Bar for all the great work that you have done throughout the years. I know that um, the Puerto Rican Bar Association, along with Pearl Def, made it possible uh, for me to go uh, to, uh, to law school. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity that uh, I had to have the professional life that has been so wonderful. Uh, as a result of the sacrifices that have been made and the pioneers that went before us. Some of them obviously have spoken this evening. So just very quickly, uh, 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 not the story, but just a little bit about my background. Uh, and I'm going to touch on some of the themes that I've already heard tonight uh, as I speak. The first one being that I did hear at least one other person uh, Judge Saparic talk about attending parochial school, and that was my case. I attended parochial school from the fifth grade forward. I have I went to the public school uh, before then, the parochial school. I have always viewed as the private school for the Puerto Rican community and the uh, other Latino communities in New York City. Uh, and so uh, I uh, am a product of those particular schools. Uh, I was raised on the Lower East Side. I'm born in New York City. I'm born into uh, what is commonly called in the data a single family headed household. My mother came from Puerto Rico in the 1940s uh, and made her life here. She, like so many women of her uh, period, um, helped build the garment industry. People will remember that New York City was known for the rag trade and my mother worked in several factories, glove factories, hat factories and so forth. Um, and she raised me and my brother and my sister uh, by herself in tenements, in projects, uh, in not such a wonderful environment. Uh, we grew up poor. There's no other way to, to color that. Um, but I always felt uh, a great deal of love and support in the family uh, that I was raised. And I very much enjoyed school. And that was my escape. I love reading. I love going to school, I love learning, I love puzzles, and that was sort of my escape from uh, everything uh, that was around me at, at the time. Um, I went to uh, Princeton University, which was my first time living outside of my home, and it was a very difficult and challenging experience for me, being away from home, being away from my mother, who I was very close to, and being away from the community that was so familiar to me. Uh, but I found, as was the case in all of the institutions I've ever uh, uh, gone to school in or worked in, I found a support network. I found my affinity groups. Uh, those were other Latinos. Those were students of color, people of color in all of those environments. Um, and they really uh, were my support network, people I became fast friends with and have remained friends with. Uh, and people who shared my view uh, and my experiences of those particular institutions. So I went to Princeton, I then went to NYU Law School, um, and then later on after working some years, I went back to law school to get a master's from Columbia because although I was deeply committed to a public interest background, which is another theme that I heard uh, from the various speakers before, that interest in public service, public interest work. And I know that uh, my colleague, Judge Garcia, has spent much of his life in government, that same sense of uh, uh, public service and uh, how important it is to our development. I've heard that from the other speakers. For myself, 
uh, and I think that's true for so many others, that was just an interest in trying to make the world better than the one that I inherited, trying to be part of a solution, trying to, to find our way through uh, the challenges that we faced. And for myself, I was very interested in civil rights and poverty law because of course that was the experience that I knew and I wanted to be part of anything that helped people like my own family, like myself, find their way and address uh, difficult uh, legal uh, challenges. Um, along the way uh, in law school, I got a real interest in teaching. And so after being in public interest for uh, being a public interest lawyer for some time, I then started what was almost a 20 year uh, career in legal academia, uh, teaching most of that time at CUNY Law School, again, teaching the next generation of public interest lawyers, but also having taught at Suffolk Law School in Boston. So I left New York to go and start my teaching career. Uh, I also taught for a brief period of time at American University in uh, DC at the law school. So uh, it's really been a, a wonderful experience teaching in all those environments and teaching all different kinds of students from all different kinds of backgrounds. Um, once the vacancy that was made available as a result of Judge Siparic having to retire from the court, I applied to the Court of Appeals. Uh, and of course that has been uh, the latest part of my legal career, having spent uh, just over seven years now uh, on the court. And all of those experiences, I have tried very hard to uh, come to them with a commitment to doing the best work that I can, to a real intellectual curiosity for the work. And those I, things I learned from my mentors, uh, my family, and just what is uh, innate to myself. Um, and of course, before and at different points in my career, I have done clerkships, which I have really treasured because they have really exposed me to this judicial decision making that I am now responsible for and the way the court system works. Uh, and I uh, clerked both in the Second Circuit Pro Se Law Clerk's Office, which was a fabulous experience when I first graduated law school. And I also clerked after a few years of practice for then Judge Sonia Sotomayor, who was sitting on the Southern District at that time. And she has been uh, very much my role model for the way I've tried to approach my work on the bench uh, and why I have found uh, uh, really her trajectory in the judiciary such an inspiration as well as uh, the inspiration of so many other people who have spoken today and who I know are in the participants. I was looking at the list who are observing the program today, other judges uh, who have gone before or who are my uh, contemporaries. Uh, I have learned so much from them and I continue to learn from them, which I think is one of the other themes, the way so many of us have learned from others as we've moved our way uh, through our particular uh, careers. The one other thing I did do for a brief period of time, and then I'll stop um, uh, because this- you're, you're, you're a little bit over time. I'm sorry. You're a little bit over time, Judge Betty, Rivera. Betty, you cut Betty. it into Judge Garcia's time. Uh, uh, I know, I'm going to segue right into Judge Garcia's time. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, previously, I did work for the Attorney General's office for a brief period of time, which I did find very satisfying and gave me a real insight into the deep commitment of government lawyers like Judge Garcia. Thank you, Judge Rivera. We are so proud of you. Um, and thank you always for saying presente to every Puerto Rican Bar Association event that we have for encouraging diversity in the profession and for everything you do. We're so proud of you. Thank you so much. Judge Garcia, please tell us uh, a little bit about your personal journey. You have thank five you. minutes. Thank you, Betty. And thank you, Judge Rivera. Um, you know, I won't repeat, obviously, given my five minutes, the thanks and the gratitude expressed by Judge Rivera, but to echo it, and especially the Puerto Rican Bar Association, which has always welcomed me and been so supportive. Thank you, Betty. Um, I grew up on Long Island. Um, my parents were high school graduates, no college. Uh, I went to school on a public school system out on the island. There were, I think, two Hispanics in my entire high school, not counting maybe our siblings. Um, and I went from there to Binghamton University, a state school. My dad, um, he started work in the mailroom of uh, Manuel Garcia in the 50s, started work in the mailroom in a shipping company. 
and actually worked his way up through, and we've heard so many stories like this tonight, impressive stories. I mean, really just working harder and uh, with such dedication and will, uh, worked his way up through that company um, to become the, the head of the company by the time he retired. Um, and really always stressed both my parents, such a cliche, but true, uh, education. And they were great lovers of books and reading, even though, as I said, they had no education beyond Brooklyn public schools, um, high school. So when it came time to go to college, I really, you know, now that I do this with my children, you know, they have so much uh, in the way of sources and guidance and I didn't know anything. And I knew, you know, I didn't want to spend all that much money and, you know, I'd have it. So I went to Binghamton. I noticed some of the other folks who have spoken tonight went to the state schools as well. And I really loved it there. Um, met some terrific teachers as I had in high school, you know, English teachers primarily. And that was really what I loved and what I majored in at the time. Um, when I graduated from Binghamton, I went to William & Mary. I had a um, teaching assistant job there and I got a master's degree. I really felt like I needed more um, than I had gotten as an undergraduate in, in that field. Worked a few years in, in like local newspaper, very local newspapers. And then I went to Albany Law School where I know you and Betty. And, uh, and they gave me a free ride. Um, they gave me a full scholarship because again, I was very concerned about finances and about, you know, how would I pay for law school? And, you know, I worked and I, but uh, I, you know, they were really very, very generous and I'll always be grateful to them for that. And there I met terrific teachers and mentors, including Professor Siegel, New York practice book, who made me his teaching assistant there and really um, was an inspiration as well. When I came out of law school, again, I didn't know any lawyers before I went there, and I really had no idea what I wanted to do. I kind of found myself channeled into a big law firm in Wall Street, um, where I was a corporate lawyer for a year, and I enjoyed it, and it was very financially rewarding, but I felt like I really wanted to do something else. Um, and I was very fortunate enough, as, as Judge Rivera said, with her clerkships to get a clerkship with uh, then Associate Judge Judith Kay, who we've heard about also tonight and who has been an inspiration as well for so many folks. Um, and she hired me for a two-year clerkship and it was really in, you know, Hank Greenberg who clerked there before me says the hardest he ever worked in his life. I mean, we worked incredibly hard and she was really such a, a fine jurist, but such an amazing person and force in the law. So I would consider her really one of the people who guided me the most in, in my career. And as I was leaving that clerkship, um, I realized that I didn't want to go back to a law firm at that point. I wanted to continue in public service in some way. So I went into a, a series, which I know I only have five minutes, I won't get into, but of various public service jobs. Um, in the federal government for the most part, uh, in the U.S. Attorney's Office, down in Washington, Homeland Security. I came back as the United States Attorney in Manhattan uh, in the, for 05 to 08, and really got to see how the system worked um, on the executive branch side from, from the inside, and I, I love that. And then in 08, I left. I became a partner at a law firm for seven years, and um, that was long enough. Again, I enjoyed my clients. I enjoyed the work. I enjoyed the pro bono side of it. Um, but I, I really wanted to take a job again where I felt that I could contribute in a, in a service type way. And um, in 2016, I uh, was lucky enough to be selected for the Court of Appeals. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Garcia. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, the one thing about both of you is that Although you're on the top court of New York, New York State, you're still very humble. And that is um, the takeaway that I, I get from, um, from both of you. Judge Jenny Rivera, I don't believe you mentioned that you started the Claro Project at CUNY Queens Law School, the Center for Latino Rights and Responsibilities, which is a program that is still uh, um, uh, going on today at CUNY Queens and teaches um, everyone 
about the 14th Amendment and the rights and responsibilities of, of everyone. But um, Professor, then Professor Jenny Rivera started that program and thank you so much for doing that. Um, and uh, Judge Michael Garcia also, also very involved with Albany Law School, involved with the students and still gives back to Albany Law School and mentors uh, young lawyers and, and future, um, future lawyers. Um, so the next question, uh, which is, um, sorry. So the evolution from, discuss your evaluation of the evolution of Latinos on the bench. Where are we today? The experiences, you heard the experiences of la the Latino pioneer judges, um, the positives, the negatives, implicit bias. This year, you know, we had the, uh, the study from Jay Johnson. Um, where do you see um, judges today and, and, and um, the future of Latino judges in New York? Judge uh, Jenny Rivera. Well, I'll let Judge Garcia start since I started the last one. We can play tag. That's on the that. one about my background. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Betty. Look, I, you know, I, I would say what I've heard my friend presiding justice, uh, Orlando Acosta, who we all know say, you know, there's been measurable progress and there's work to be done. I think that's the line that he uses and he writes and speaks a great deal about this topic. And I think that's true. I mean, he tells a story that back, you know, in the early days, he has a photo, the Latino judges in New York, 1985, and there's 13 people in the picture forward to 2020, there's 90 Latino judges in New York, which is, and everyone would agree, incredible progress, but given the population in New York, you know, obviously work to be done to get a representative sample. I mean, I think this segues too into what we're, we're talking about generally on this topic, which is how important is that, you know, and how, uh, what's the value of it? And, and, you know, again, you go back to Judge Kay, who would say that, that a diverse bench gives the public this feeling of inclusion and confidence in the system. Um, and by the same token, when you point out problems and institutional issues the way Jay Johnson has, and I, I know Jay Johnson for a long time, and I have great respect for him. And when you point out those types of issues, um, it likewise makes you realize, you know, how much is left to be done and what we need to do to try to redouble efforts to get that feeling out there of confidence, which, you know, quite frankly, has been shaken at times in, in, in the recent past. Uh, and I think, look, I, I'm not a pessimist. <laughs> um, I'm an optimist. And I think the work that goes on is, is good work. And the voices that you hear are strong voices that we've heard tonight um, and how important it is to hear them and to give them a platform. So, you know, I, I applaud the work that people are doing now. And I recognize that we're not in a place that anyone feels like, great, we're done. Um, and I, I really have so, so, so much admiration for the folks that continue in that, in that, in that field. So bottom line, um, you know, my experience on the bench has been a, a great one. And my experience going through the process, you know, I, I had no, I felt no issues that way, but I have no doubt that, that ex I was able to have that experience because of what others have experienced in the past and fought for and the, the work that they've done to, to get to a, us to the point we're at now. So I can't tell you here, and, and I came to the bench also very late in my career, unlike a lot of other people we've heard from, um, like Carmen Saparic, who, who worked her way through various levels of the judiciary. I came onto the bench later um, I came on to at a time, I think, where the process was very different and the people involved in that process were very different. Judge Kay was chairing the commission when I went through. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate in that way. But again, I recognize that that's not luck. That's the work of many others that, that had to do face much, much greater adversity. Thank you, Judge Garcia. Judge Rivera. Yeah, I echo uh, very much what my colleague Judge Garcia has said. I mean, I think numerically, yes, when you go to z from zero to some, 
that is progress. It's certainly not the kind of progress that we should be proud of, but the effort behind it, we should always be proud of. So I think in that way, uh, yes, the, the numbers are certainly not where we want them to be, uh, but we also have to recognize that if we are only focusing on the numbers of Latinos on the bench without thinking of the entire pipeline and where that pipeline is corroded along the way, that we are missing an opportunity for real change. So the numbers have to change, not only uh, in the sense that there has to be an opening and an opportunity and an interest from those who affect those numbers, that is from those who uh, are the ones who are going to make recommendations, the ones who are going to give the reference letters, the ones who are going to be on the committees, the ones who are uh, going to do the appointments, the ones who are going to help with the electoral process. But we also have to recognize that we need to be, in my opinion, looking at the third grade and moving forward. So we always have young people who are moving through who can really see that a dream is obtainable, not merely a pipe dream in that in that pipeline. Uh, and so I think we have to think of it that way, but I agree that uh, going from zero to sum is, is, uh, is positive. It's just not, it's just not, it has not exponentially changed. And that's the real problem at the end of the day. Although I am very proud of the work when it comes to our court of appeals, uh, because our court of appeals is quite uh, diverse, right? The second uh, female chief judge, two Latinos simultaneously on the court the first time in its history an African-American on the court along with, uh, with the two of us, uh, the first openly gay member of the court. So really a lot of changes uh, in the court, which I think are very positive, uh, certainly for the reason that Judge Garcia has mentioned and others have mentioned the public confidence that is necessary. But uh, it, to the extent, you know, I've spent a long time in my life in that civil rights area, it's also because it is a way to show that barriers are being broken. And that is to say the obstacles, the racism, the sexism that continues to be a barrier is beginning to fall, is beginning to be challenged. So it's not merely the public confidence, because I agree that that is the large share of this, but it is also a recognition that there has been an injustice that needs to be remedied and that that's what happens when you diversify our profession, the legal profession, and uh, with respect to the conversation we're having now, the bench, the judiciary, that that is about undoing what has gone wrong, not merely about ensuring that our communities are representative of everyone who's in them. That is true, that is singularly important, but um, sort of that, that, that sense of justice, I think is also critical to the way we think about it. The other thing I would say is, and it'll be my last point on this, in addition to the numbers and what they mean, we also have to recognize that we continue to be at a place where we are seeking respect for each of us as well as, as members of a Latino community. That is to say that members on the bench, women, people of color, Latinos, Latinas, we're all seeking to be treated with the respect that anyone would give to another judge who is not from our community. That's, we, first of all, we don't want anyone to expect uh, or to be surprised by the fact that we write very well, we're quite bright, we are actually able to render decisions that are cited and binding precedent, that that is what we need. And I really do welcome the day when Judge Garcia and I will sit on that bench and I will not be called Judge Garcia, not because that's not an honor, <laughs> But because people will recognize that we're not exactly alike and that he won't be mistaken for Judge Rivera. Again, not because it's a sign of disrespect in the sense of I don't want to be associated with Judge Garcia, quite the contrary, but rather because it is an understanding that we will be given the respect we are due as individual judges. I, I Yes, on occasion, a judge will uh, call, uh, excuse me, a litigant, uh, a lawyer will call a judge by an incorrect name. But we are not yet at the point where when one, might, one white male judge is called by another white male judge, that is somehow has all of the history 
of oppression behind it. It doesn't. But when there's a misnaming, or when, as Judge Sipparik said, she's believed to be the secretary or the translator, interpreter, as opposed to a member of the profession, that is laden with the history of racism, sexism, oppression, colonialism when it comes to the Puerto Rican community that we're all uh, so very much aware of. And so I, I think that is the other part, which is almost the harder part. I think it's easier to persuade people that numbers matter in a real sense, sort of the example that I always give. I, I don't think people would think it's a, it's a representative bench if every person on the Court of Appeals was a Puerto Rican woman. I might feel very comfortable with it. I think we'd render some wonderful decisions, but I don't think anyone would say that's fully representative of the breadth of experience of New York, right? But I think it's harder to persuade someone that there are reasons why the bench needs to diversify along with our profession because it has meaning behind numbers. And then every member of that profession, every judge on the court has to be treated based on the merits of what they bring without underestimating their abilities because of their ethnicity or sex uh, gender, right? But because of what they bring and how they add value and how they inform the development of the rule of law, because as Judge Garcia has pointed out so brilliantly about Chief Judge Kay, she loved the law. She was deeply committed to the development of the rule of law. And I think all of us as judges want to be recognized for our ability to engage with that part of the judicial deliberative process in a way that is not limited by the fact that male, female, Puerto Rican, Cuban, some other Latino group, Dominican, excuse me, some other Latino group, or of any background, right? That that's what at the end we want to persuade everyone to understand of the singular importance of our presence and what we bring to the bench. Thank you, Judge Rivera. Thank you, Judge Garcia. We're at the end of the program, but I do want you to at least speak briefly about the future. What are the strategies to increase inclusiveness, eliminate bias, and enhance access to justice that can be implemented? I know you've addressed a little bit in the conversation, but what are these strategies that you believe? How important is it for the judiciary to reflect the diversity of the state's population? I believe you've answered that as well. And um, so just, uh, if you could briefly talk about what strategies do we have to increase yeah. that uh, inclusiveness? Maybe I'll, I'll go, Jen. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in thinking about this, you look at the numbers and getting back to, you know, the point Judge Rivera made, I made, the numbers are better because anything's better than nothing, but um, more work to be done. But the numbers and appointments on the benches that are appointed positions are better than the elected positions in terms of diversity. Um, and that's a tough one. You know, that's the electoral process. And that means recruiting candidates. And that's a world I don't know. I never experienced it. I, I never was in it. But it's so critical because of New York's judiciary um, and all of those positions, you know, county court, Supreme Court that are elected. And then from there to the appellate division, you need to be an elected Supreme. Um, how important it is for us to find those folks who are willing not only to serve, but to go through the process of, you know, an election. Um, that's difficult. And again, I, I've never done it. So I see that one as one of the big challenges in New York for doing that. I think in terms of a general approach, it's something, you know, I, I don't know, I just now at this stage of my career, <laughs> you find out you've you know, doing this all of a sudden you realize for a long time. And when that really hits home for me is in the, in the last, I would say five plus years, when I see these new lawyers coming, or as you mentioned, I go to the law schools and not only Albany, I go to other schools as I know Judge Rivera does and speak and speak to different groups. You know, you realize that they, you know, as we've seen folks that were here and face these challenges that were so steep, you know, historically and did so much work. I look at these students and younger, as, as Judge Rivera said, 
and they're going to face challenges different than the ones that we've seen before and in ways incomprehensible to us. Like it's just, you can't imagine what they're going to have to deal with. Look, we saw a brief, you know, terrible snapshot of that this past year. We don't know what, what those challenges will be and how important it is now to reach out younger than law school to start you know, imparting what we can and mentoring or guiding to the extent we can the generation that's going to have to really be at the forefront um, for that. That has struck me so much recently. And I, maybe it's just a function of working in such an intense environment with law clerks who for the most part are fairly junior lawyers, um, which raises different challenges. But um, and thinking no longer are you, you know, all, all, you know, I think our professional lives, we, you know, you want to achieve, you want to do well, you're in this race. You do finally get to this point where you step back a little bit and you start to think about, you know, I'm not competing. I'm not, um, I'm, I have a different responsibility. And that's daunting, I think, one. And, and but in a way it's, it's been, you know, one of the things I love the most about this job on the Court of Appeals, because it does give you that ability to get out of the courthouse and to speak to bar associations and meet young, you know, junior lawyers out of law school or to go to the schools and to, to listen to their issues and, and to try to help in some way to guide them. And you do feel, and Judge Rivera touched on this with Judge Sotomayor and with Judge Kay or with other folks that are, you owe that debt um, because those people did that for you. You know, that they reached out and without the guidance of, of Judge Kay or David Siegel, I, I wouldn't have had the jobs or the opportunities I had. And what's our obligation um, to do that for others? Because you have such talented people out there facing really now, look at this year, such adversity and some of the issues we've discussed today that linger on and present challenges, um, you know, what is our obligation to do that? So I pretend not to have the answer to that, but I can really say that in the last few years, I've, I've tried to make that effort to get out. And, and it's not only I find helpful, um, I hope for the, the people you're speaking to, to at least here, maybe some of the things you've done that you would do differently, but um, also to listen to them and to hear kind of the issues they're facing in their starting out their careers. And um, it, it's, it's eye opening. And I will let Judge Rivera go. I don't want to monopolize it. But I, I will say I saw that also at a big law firm where I saw, you know, some of the challenges faced by new associates coming out of law school into a big firm environment and you know not necessarily within the firm but in the practice of law i saw issues i i, I saw you know things that you you know find repulsive in in certain ways and in the ways people are not overtly but subtle things and and you still see that and you still see you know in this you know 2015 16 you know, see junior associates to, you know, having to deal with some of these issues. So I think there's so much work that still needs to be done. The hard, hard thing is figuring out a way that you can be accessible uh, and a valuable um, resource for those folks. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's worth doing because I always come back to that same thought, and I have it often now, that they are those people that are brand new, newly minted lawyers that, you know, we're thinking, oh, do they know how to do a bench memo? They're going to be the ones whose name is on the decisions at some point or making those tough calls who are, you know, and the more you can do to help them prepare for that, the better off, you know, everyone's going to be. So long kind of maybe long meandering answer, but Thank you, Judge Garcia. Thank you, Judge Rivera. Yeah, no, those were some really good points. I agree. Um, so I'll just make a few points because I know time is 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 gone uh, and there's not much left for me really to say. 
Um, but maybe moving from the micro to the macro level. I agree that uh, we need to uh, support those who are coming up behind us, but even our contemporaries, uh, and we can serve as mentors, but I think we also need to think about how we can serve as champions and who can be champions. There's a big difference between a mentor and a champion. You know, a champion uh, basically puts their name behind you in a way that a mentor is, of course, helping you along the way, uh, trying to give you guidance, but a champion is associating their name with you. And they, they rise and fall, and you rise and fall with them. And that's a, a very different uh, position, and I think we need to look for more of those people, and we need to be those people ourselves for others. Uh, I think we need to also, uh, each of us, and as bar associations, look for ways to create leadership opportunities uh, for, as Judge Garcia is referring to, sort of the junior lawyers, as people are uh, coming into the profession. Uh, because that's what made the difference. When I had leadership opportunities or opportunities to shine, those were very stressful moments, but that really grew professionally as a result and people got to know my work. And that's what, you know, makes hopefully a future judge on some other court or the future head of Latino justice or, you know, the future head of the president's task force on who knows what. Uh, and so uh, that's really, really uh, important that we continue to push for and we find ways for leadership opportunities for um, uh, our, our junior lawyers, for law students, and those who are even thinking about the law. It's really critical that they get that opportunity. And then this is sort of my macro uh, point, and it, it, it's sort of the vision that we take with it, I think. Um, we need to really think of the changes that we're talking about, not purely as a question of diversity is a good thing. It is. This is not disputed amongst any member of, of the Puerto Rican bar, and I think of anyone who's participating at, either as a panelist or observing today. But what we need to think about is how do we make the project of improving the bench, improving our profession, having it be more diverse. How do we make that project about a remedy of past injustice? Because that's where it is. I think we've lost our way when we move to thinking about, okay, how do we right wrongs? How do we make sure things are just to, oh, we want diversity because we think that's a good thing. It is a good thing, <laughs> but it's also a, about a cure for a past that is just wrong. And right now the country is of course in this moment where I think people are asking us all to be reflective and to think about how we can make the world much better than it has been in the past. And you know, the, uh, we'll see where that goes. But this is sort of my point. And when we're reflecting, we're thinking about not only how it could be better, but how do we get to a point where we're looking at numbers that are the same as Judge Garcia points out that the uh, uh, Justice Acosta and many other people uh, have, have mentioned, and I know uh, uh, Justice Sally Mancenet has done a wonderful numeric review of sort of where we are in New York City, both on the elected and the appointed side, uh, and really shown the numbers for what they are. But, you know, what, what is it that got us to those numbers? Not only the good thing that got us from none to some, but what is it that got us to so few? What, what is going on there and how can we address that? Again, as a social justice question, not merely as a question of, we want to make sure that, uh, that, that we're representative of communities. That is a social justice question, but something a little bit uh, deeper. So I'll end it at that. And again, I wanna thank uh, uh, the Historical Society of Puerto Rican Bar and everyone who's had their hand in making the program possible. And I do wish everyone and their families that you are all safe and staying healthy uh, in this very difficult and challenging moment as we close off a very difficult COVID-19 year.